se pueden sentar. Ese, 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 Lo um, siento. Ese, calcim, ese canto es para el último.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. We're so grateful and thankful that you guys were all able to come here and worship our Lord, right? Thank you so much for the worship team. That was powerful, um, and I feel like everyone um, felt our Lord tonight. Um, we want to give you guys a welcome. Um, we're going to say our name and what church we're coming from and what the network is. So my name is Rocio, and I come from Anaheim Spanish. My name is Vanessa Escobar, and I come from Costa Mesa Spanish. My name is Fidel, and I come from Costa Mesa. Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Jackson, and I come from Emanuel Spanish, also uh, the IR, <laughs> also known as Ewa. And um, just to talk to you guys a little bit about what the network is, uh, we were approached by Pastor Panic and we were told about this ministry, right? And then what we understood from it is that we're no longer just churches, like, you know, everywhere, but we should all be just one church, right? And so, you know, if we could apply that to today, I think a word that kind of resonates is the network, right? So we're a network of churches that, you know, our job is to spread the message as far as we can. And I think what's going to happen eventually is that we're all going to just become one, you know? And I feel like that's what we're, you know, trying to get to, and I feel like that's what we all should try to get to, and, you know, no longer be separated by, you know, like anything, but we should just all be one. All right, so thank you for coming and being here today. Y nomás para dejar de saber hoy, este, el mensaje va a estar en inglés, porque es para los jóvenes. So, yo sé que ustedes sí saben inglés, you know, un poquito y todo eso, pero, you know, acérquense con un joven y que les traduzca o algo, Google Translate, whatever you need, you know, you got to do it. But thank you for being here. Gracias por estar aquí. And I, I just want to say some words about Mr. Gill here. Uh, Mr. Gill is, I like to call him Mr. Clutch. Uh, he, man, he just comes through every time. And uh, he has a really powerful testimony that I feel like we should all listen to because it, it, it talks to us in like so many different levels. And I hope, you know, that you, this, you guys find as well. Thank you for that introduction. I was not expecting that at all. <laughs> so how is everybody doing tonight? So they just giving me an hour and 30 minutes to talk to you guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, the, the clock is upside down, I think. I think that's what happened. Um, so how much time do I have? Like 15, 20 minutes? Okay, cool. So anyway, so for those of you guys that don't know me, my name is Gilbert Pereda. Uh, for those of you guys that, do, that do know me, my name is still the same. Uh, some of you guys may follow me on social media, and I'm very thankful for that uh, as Gil's photography. Uh, I am a photographer, soy fotógrafo profesional. Uh, I'm a fashion photographer, which is very different, right? But before I became a fashion photographer, I was a sound engineer. I'm still a sound engineer. I like everything that has to do with cables, everything that has to do with sound, everything that has to do with harmonies. If it doesn't sound good and I'm running sound, don't blame it on me. It's, it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> but before I became a, a sound engineer, I was just a guy, right? I was just a dude. And um, before I was just a dude, I was just a little kid. And before that, um, when I was around five years old, cuando, cuando apenas tenía cinco años, no sé cuántos de ustedes conocen la voz de la esperanza. Yeah, the voice of prophecy. Sí, todos, ok. Bueno, pues mi mamá, de una manera u otra, nos hacía una travesura. Les voy a contar una historia rápidamente. No era una travesura mala, it was actually a good thing that she did that. But at the time, when we were little, I'm, I'm the youngest of five, just so you guys know. And uh, my brother, my, my brother right before me is Pastor Pereda. He's from the Costa Mesa Church. I'm from Costa Mesa Spanish as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. We got to represent, right? And, uh, and we're moving to another church now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so anyway, so my mom, every Sunday morning, pasaba en, en los episodios de La Voz de la Esperanza. Así que we were tired from Saturday, right? Like, do you guys get tired on Saturdays? Like, if you have a full day, and then Sunday morning, you just want to sleep in, right? You're thinking, man, like, I went to in and out last night, and you guys got veggie burgers. And then, <laughs> and then after that, like, you, you guys were like, man, like, we play volleyball para bajar las, you know, las, 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 este, la grasa de la hamburguesa. You know, you guys don't drink soda, too, so that's good. Um, so anyway, so we did all that, right, when I was little. And then on Sunday morning at 7 a.m., no fallaba. My mom would blast the, we had like one of those cool radio things that would, that would have a speaker in every room. I don't know what they're called. Like an intercom 
intercom system. So anyway, so that was pretty cool. So she would blast that thing, right? To, a todo volumen le ponía mi mamá ahí y empezaba el, el, el... ¿Quién era el pastor que presentaba antes? Antes, antes. El pastor Milton Peverini, es cierto. ¿Y cómo decía? La voz de la esperanza. Empezaba a hablar, ¿no? Entonces cuando nosotros escuchábamos la música, we were like, oh my goodness, like estábamos durmiendo todavía. Mom, like turn it off, right? We didn't want to hear about it. Pero si le bajábamos volumen al estéreo, ¿qué creen que pasaba? Mi mamá llegaba a la recámara y le daba otra vez volumen y dice, si lo vuelven a tocar esto, les voy a dar un chanclazo. Right? So we didn't want that at all. Los pies de mi mamá son de este tamaño, pero cuando nos pegaba, they were like this big, like no joke. Like seriously, like no joke. So then I, I was like, okay, well, wh whatever. Like we, we listened to it and it was, it, it was cool. Like we, that's how we grew up. So I want to invite you guys to open your Bibles. You guys brought your Bibles, right? Okay, I figure, I figure. I just wanted to double check. Digital Bible or paper Bible, that's great. Print. Okay, busquemos en Proverbios 22, 6. El que lo encuentre primero, diga amén, por favor. Proverbios 22, 6. Y si esto. Thank you. Me estaban tomando una foto aquí, así que tenía que pasar. Proverbios 22, 6. ¿Ya lo tienen todos? Vamos a leerlo. Y dice: Si instruye al niño en el camino que debe seguir. Y aun cuando fuere viejo, no se apartará de él. You guys hear that? Let's read it again. Instruye al niño en el camino que debe seguir, y aun cuando fuere viejo, no se apartará de él. So my parents told us this every single time, every single day. Y cuando me iba a ir a la primaria, yo llegaba a, la, a, a una escuela primaria where it was in my district, right? So we were cheating, just for a little bit. Y en eso llegábamos a la casa de mi abuelita y llegaba mi tía antes de, de que nos fuéramos de ahí. Me decía, me decía una parte de la Biblia, decía, eh, si los pecadores te quisieran engañar, no pecares. Right? Pero entonces después de eso salía mi abuelito al otro lado de la ventana y me decía, pero no voy a engañar a los pecadores. <laughs> I never did, I never did. But anyway, so it was cool growing up, going to church, a, a church very similar to this, pero era la iglesia de San Bernardino. No sé si ustedes han tenido la, la oportunidad de ir para allá. Se, se parece mucho a esta iglesia, pero esta iglesia está más bonita, ¿verdad? Porque estamos aquí ahorita nosotros. Así que yo crecí de esa manera. I was raised SDA. I didn't know what it was like to go out there, to, to go to like the worldly life, como le dicen por ahí, ¿no? So I started growing up. Y me di cuenta de que I was missing out, on a, missing out on a few things here and there. And so, nunca se me olvidaba esta parte de la Biblia. Y durante mi crecimiento empecé a cambiar de pensar. Siempre habíamos sido directores de, 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 de early teens. I was, a, I was a, a youth director later on when I, became, when I was 15. Y, lo, y nos fuimos pasando así de, de diferentes grupos a diferentes grupos. Todos con mis hermanos. Después mis hermanos fueron a estudiar teología a la iglesia, a, a la Universidad de Montemorelos. ¿Alguien los conoce? Alumni, ok. Bueno, yo no fui, así que no, I'm not an alumni. Pero anyway, so then uh, I started seeing things in a very different way. And I started seeing, like, I was like, man, like, I was missing out. I was like, porque if my friends go out on Friday nights, why can't I go out on a Friday night, right? Have you guys ever questioned that before? Why do I have to wait till Saturday afternoon, late Saturday afternoon, especially on a summer day, so that I can go buy something, so that I can go and do all these things. Y déjenme decirles, mis papás no eran tan estrictos con nosotros, pero we couldn't go to, we couldn't go to see a movie at the theater when we were little. So, which is great, you know, like, esa es una parte de la creencia y enseñanza de mis padres. We're very thankful for that. Pero yo me sentía como que I was isolated from this other part of the world. Right? From this other part that I thought was really cool, where I could be a hipster, and I'm not a hipster yet, but like I, I never want to be a hipster. But like it was cool. Like these were like the cool kids, and I wanted to hang out with the cool kids because they got to do everything that was fun, right? So anyway, so I started I started visiting places, different locations that I, you guys should never go there. But I started visiting clubs and I started drinking and I never smoked, but I, I would see people that were smoking. Empecé poco a poco, empecé a relacionarme con gente que no iba a ser buena para mi, vid, para mi vida espiritual. Así de que estas personas me decían, mira, no era agua, me decían, si tú tomas esto, nothing's gonna happen. ¿Es okay if we do it in Spanglish for now? Ok, cool. So me decían, nada te va a pasar si tomas esto. And it was very inviting for me. 
But you know what? Like, I was like, you know, es, es que no sé. I, I, the first couple of times, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I should. Mis papás me dijeron de que I shouldn't. But I was like, but you know what? My parents are not here, and I'm already 18, or I'm already, like, 23. I'm already 24. It, it, and I kept, and, and it kept going. Y todo se me hacía más fácil, hermano. Todo decía, salud. Todo decíamos, okay, si, si quiero ir a hacer algo malo, lo puedo hacer. No one has to know. Right? We think like that sometimes. So, para lo que yo decía, es que voy a hacer todas estas cosas malas, and then later on, voy a ir a pedir perdón. Cuando yo me acuerde de que, de que, de que hay una religión, de que hay una iglesia donde tengo que ir, entonces voy a regresar allá. But you know what? Little by little, I started getting bored. And I was like, you know what? My, my real friends go to church on a Friday night. Why don't I go to church on a Friday night anymore? Why am I singing songs that I'm not supposed to be singing? I'm worshiping something else that is not my God, that was not my creator. And what's going on right now with me? But I, I couldn't move. It was like I felt stuck. It was like, it was like something was holding me back. It was like, no me podía mover porque sentía que algo me tenía abrazado. And yes, I was living in sin. And that was the saddest part of my life. But then you know what? It kept on going and going and going. And I couldn't understand. Y quizás algunos de ustedes se digan, that happened to you, but it will never happen to me. Have you guys ever heard that before? ¿Alguna vez han escuchado ustedes, es que eso te pasó a ti, eso te sucedió a ti, pero nunca me va a suceder a mí? ¿Alguna vez lo han escuchado eso? Sí, ¿verdad? Suena conocido. Pues yo también decía eso. Y decía, es que eso nunca me va a pasar a mí. I'm living the good life. And guess what, guys? With the good life that I thought I was living, también mi income subió bastante. I was making enough money to pay for someone's salary, yearly salary, in a month. So I was, I was okay, right? So then I thought, well, you know what? I, I'm doing all these things by myself. I don't need anyone else. I don't need religion. I don't need church. I don't need a pastor. I don't need my family. All I need is myself. All I need is me, 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 and that's it. And I'm good enough for everything that I want. Everything that I have is because I'm good. It's because I'm legit. It's because I'm all this. Pero saben que, para, para mi sorpresa, one day I lost everything. I went to a Starbucks. Uh, I'm, not in, I'm not endorsed by Starbucks. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I drink a lot of tea. So um, I don't drink coffee anymore. But I went to Starbucks with one of my friends, and I was like, hey, friend, ex uh, would you like to um, get some coffee with me? And he was like, yeah, for sure. And I was like, oh, I got it, I got it. So I gave him my debit card, le di mi tarjeta del banco, and guess what? It got declined. And I was like, dude, you, you got to try that again, because it's my debit card. You know, I, I do have credit cards, but this is my debit card. There's money there. He was like, I tried it four times, and it doesn't work, man. Like, do you have another one? And my friend was like, no, 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 it's cool. Like, I, I got it, I got it. So then I called my bank the next day, and I was like, hey, so what happened? He was like, well, the thing is that someone took all your money out, and then they put it on this other bank account that you have no access to. So I lost all my money. I had not zero. I had 10 cents. <laughs> that was it. That's all I had. And I was like, oh, my God, like, what am I going to do now? Like, with 10 cents, like, I can't buy anything, right? If anything, the bank is going to charge me for having 10 cents there. And so I was like, I I didn't know what to do. My life started declining and declining and declining so much that I lost my cars. Okay. That I lost my cars, that I lost everything, that I lost the house that I bought, that I lost the family that I thought that I had. So then I slept in my only car that I, that I was able to keep that, at that moment, and I slept there for 30 days. Yeah, it was tough. I slept there for 30 days. And I was like, what, what am I going to do now? Like, there's nothing for me to do. And I was embarrassed to go back home y regresar a donde estaban mis papás y decirles, lo que pasa que I don't have anything. I lost it all. I was embarrassed. Me sentía como el hijo, como aquel hijo. El, como el hijo pródigo, hermanos, que regresé. But guess what my parents did? You think they closed doors on me? You think they pushed me away? No, they did. They did. No, 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 no. Mis papás, cuando llegué a la casa, 
y yo les conté lo que había pasado. Ellos abrieron la puerta aún más todavía. And they were like, no, you can stay here, of course. You can live with us for as long as you want. And I was embarrassed, and I had to tell them everything that had happened in my life. Believe it or not, losing a dollar, it's bad, right? Like when you only have two bucks and you lost a, and you lost, you lose a dollar, it's like, oh my gosh, like oh, that was my only dollar that I had extra. And then I have to pay for my girlfriend's or, or your, your boyfriend's drink or whatever. And then you don't have anything. Well, I didn't have anything. I didn't even have a dollar. I didn't have anything to my name. So then poco a poco, instead of, instead of going back to church, I would go to church just to like sit there And then I was like, you know what, like, thi this, is, this, is, this is not for me. So I would sit all the way in the back. I'm not judging anyone. But I would sit all the way in the back. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm just going to sit here. I don't want no one to recognize me. No one needs to know that I'm back in church. No one needs to see that, I'm, I'm, like, this is humiliating to me, right? And I was like, I, no one needs to see that. That's so much drama that I don't need in my life right now. So me sentaba en la parte de atrás y no entendía, na no ponía nada de atención. Y estaba rebelde. Y una vez mis papás me preguntaron, hey, so, like, do you, do you want to get back in church? Do you want to get involved? Do you want to do all these things? And I was like, you know what? This is God's fault. This is your God's fault. Because of him, I lost everything that I had. I lost my family. I lost my cars. I lost my house. The, 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 it's, a it's a brand new house. I was like, I lost everything. I don't have anything anymore. What can I do? What would you guys do? And, 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 and instead of saying, like, you know what? I messed up. I was blaming God for what I had just done. Y seguían pasando los días, y seguían pasando los días. Y todos los días, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to pray. I don't remember how to pray, but I'm going to do it either way. I'm going to try. And I would try. Guys, y yo, me, yo me sentaba a, así al lado de mi cama porque quería orar, but I couldn't. Because I felt like I had, like, little voices, like, Like right around me, telling me, hey, why are you going to pray? You're just going to waste your time. Don't waste your time. So, después de un día, estaba haciendo ejercicio, because I wanted to get, release some stress. So, I was working out, and I was like, I was like, man, like, I'm tired. And I was like, and it wasn't, I wasn't tired of working out. I was tired of life. And I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. Me, me sentía cansado, me sentía agotado de todo lo que la vida me había dado, a pesar de que todavía era considerado un joven. Me sentía completamente cansado, como que si toda una vida había pasado sobre mí, no en mí, pero sobre mí, y que me había matado estando yo en vida. ¿Does that make sense? I was dead. I was gone. Like mentally, I wasn't there. So I was working out there, like at home, in, in the garage, and I was like, God, if you're there, and if you can still hear me, I want to tell you something. And I was like, I, I don't know how to pray. I don't, I don't know where to start. I, I don't know what, what, what brought me here, but I don't, I don't want this in my life anymore. Y le empecé a contar a Dios todo lo que yo había hecho, como que el Cien no me hubiera visto. Como que el Cien nunca hubiera visto todo lo, que, todo lo malo que yo había hecho. And you know what? I kept going and going and going. And then when I realized I was working out, I, I had worked out for like two hours, which is pretty good. But I was like, man, like I'm tired. And I started crying. And my tears took over my sweat. And I was like, what, what, what is going on? I was like, is this the, the way that I'm going to give my life back to Christ? I didn't know because I was lost. But I was like, you know what? In Jesus' name, just please take my life. And I got off from there, and I started reading this book that was recommended to me. And the book was pretty good. And I was interested. I was very interested. Y una vez hablé con mi hermano por teléfono, el, mi hermano el mayor, y es un pastor too. Y le estaba hablando y le estaba platicando porque ellos estaban interesados en mi vida, because they wanted me to get better, right? And so he was like, he was like, dude, you just gotta pray, man. You just gotta tell Jesus, like, hey, Jesus, like, I feel like this. I want you to take over. And so I didn't, I didn't know how, but I told him, I was like, no, es que hoy en la, hoy en la tarde hablé con Jesús y le dije todos mis pecados y le confesé todo eso. My brother was like, okay, that's good, perfect. Keep it, keep it going. So I'm back to sleep. Y en eso que está, después de leer mi libro, me fui a dormir. Y en eso que estaba durmiendo, alguien llegó y movió mi cama. And I thought, I thought, we're in Southern California. This is an earthquake for sure. But nothing else was moving. Everything was dark in my room. 
y todo estaba completamente silencioso. Nada se movía. It was just my bed. So I was like, you know what? Ah, no debe ser nada. Quizás estoy un poco débil because I worked out so much. It's all good. I'm going to go back to sleep. So me cobijé otra vez y, me, y llega algo y tiembla más todavía mi cama. To the point where, que casi me caía de la cama. And I was like, okay, cool. This is, this is, this is probably like the sun and dress fall or something. Something's going on. There's a big earthquake here. Pero para mi sorpresa otra vez, nada alrededor se estaba moviendo. Únicamente mi cama para despertarme. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to talk to Jesus again. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to depend from now on on Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put everything aside and I'm going to let Jesus take over. So I got on my knees and I start praying there. And I start praying hard. And I was like, man, like, I was like, I know that you created me for a reason. I know that you brought me here for a reason. I know that you took me out from where I was for a reason. So in the, tonight, like, I want you to take over. But then guess what happened? En todo lo que estaba pasando, I went back to being rebellious again in my prayer. I started saying, you know what? Come to think of it, because of you, I lost everything. Because of you, I lost my Mercedes. Because of you, I lost my BMW. Because of you, I lost a house that was $700,000. Because of you, I don't have any money in the bank. Because of you, I'm back to living here with my parents. Because of you, there's all these other problems. Because of you, because of you, because of you, and it was never me. So in my prayer, me caí. I fell down. And I, and I started crying like a little kid. And I was like, what, what is going on? So me levanté del piso, and I'm sitting there, and I'm wiping off my tears. And I was like, what, what just happened? And I'm in this room, huge room. And I, all of a sudden, I start hearing this loud music, like club, club music. And I was like, oh, man, like, I was like, am I back to, like, what I thought was my regular life? And so I started looking around, and it was an empty room. And I was like, what is going on here? And I was like, I, was, I thought it was, I was in my room, but I guess I fell asleep, and one of my friends brought me here again. And so all of a sudden, some of my friends started walking into this room. Y ellos se sentaban ahí, llegaban, y ellos llegaban, no, no con sus manos vacías, sino que llegaban con bebidas alcohólicas. Y estaban ahí, y ellos no me podían ver. Pero yo los estaba viendo. And I was like, hey, I was like, drinking buddy, what, why are you doing that? Why are you drinking that? That's so bad for you. I was like, there are better ways for you to, to talk to someone and feel better. There are better ways for you to tell someone, hey, like, I feel by myself. I feel lonely. I feel like I need to, like, just quit life overall. But he couldn't hear me. And then I started seeing other people come in, all of my other friends, that they started walking in. But they couldn't hear me. And I was screaming out loud. I was like, hey, guys, like, you guys are going to die if you guys keep going that route. You're going to lose everything. Just like I lost everything. Because of what I did, I lost everything. Because of the consequences of what I did before, I lost everything. Y en eso, de tanto era la música, de tanto era el bullicio, que el lugar empezó a temblar. Because it was so loud, and I couldn't take it anymore, and I, my ears just couldn't take it, and I started covering my ears. And, and, and I started, go, like, me estaba moviendo en el piso como si fuera un niño, y llorando, y llorando, y tapan, tapándome los oídos para que esta música se fuera de ahí, para que las risas que mis amigos, quote, unquote, se estaban burlando de mí, se callara. Pero nada de eso pasaba. Así que empecé a mover mis pies como podía, y cuando moví mis pies, tiré, tiré una de las velas que estaba ahí, y ¿qué creen que pasó? De repente aparecieron unas cortinas en ese cuarto, y una de las velas pegó en las cortinas, y esas cortinas empezaron a salir fuego. Empezaron a agarrar fuego, empezaron a agarrar muchísima fuerza. Y la fuerza de ese fuego venía contra mí, así que yo empecé a correr en contra de ese fuego, hacia donde supuestamente estaban mis amigos. But I couldn't get to my friends. Because there was this huge glass. There was this wall. There was this barrier between us. And I couldn't tell them, hey, like, run away from this fire because it will kill you. And the smoke started getting to me. And I was like, my gosh, like, what is going on? El, el humo y el fuego se venía en contra, en contra mí cada vez más y más y más y más. Así que de tanto que corría que me tropecé. Y en eso que me tropecé, una de las llamas me agarró de la pierna. 
y mi, y mi pierna se empezó a quemar. Yo no sé si alguna vez ustedes se han quemado, but it hurts a lot. Y empecé a llorar y, y trataba de, de caminar, pero I couldn't, because my, my leg was burning. And so I was like, what is going on? Guys, like, help me. But they couldn't help me. I couldn't get help from my friends. El fuego empezó a agarrar más, más fuerza todavía. And then all this fire, like, started consuming me. To the point where I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't move it away from me. Este fuego se había, me había atrapado completamente. No podía hacer nada más. Me sentía el hombre más inútil. That was just my time. Y no podía hacer nada. Lo único que se me ocurrió y me acordé en ese momento es de que Cristo Jesús vino a morir por mí. Lo único que me acordé en ese momento es de que Dios me había creado y de que Él nunca me iba a desamparar. En ese momento, como pude, porque el humo me estaba ahogando, tuve que gritar, Jesús, sálvame, y estiré mi mano y Jesús vino y me rescató. Hermanos, cuando yo sentí esa fuerza, esa, ese brazo que entró al fuego, and he pulled me up, I woke up. And I was still laying on the floor. And I was sweating. And I was, I was shaking. I couldn't control myself. But I was very thankful. I was scared, but I was very thankful because God was able to show me where I was and where he took me out of. Dios en ese momento me pudo, me pudo demostrar y mostrar a mis ojos de dónde me había sacado, de dónde me había rescatado. Y algunas veces nosotros sentimos, man, like, this is it for me. There is no, there, there is nothing I can do, like, that's it. But you know what? God is calling you for a reason. Hace poco tuve una invitación de ser parte de una iglesia en uh, Riverside. Y iba a ayudar con el sonido, iba a ayudar con los jóvenes. And, uh, y me iban a pagar. But I declined it. Um, why, you may ask yourself? Because I know that God has a plan. Y como me dijeron mis hermanos, lo que pasa es que Dios tiene un plan para ti. Lo que pasa es que Dios tiene algo mejor para ti. And this tonight, like I'm telling you guys, God has something better for you. You just have no idea what it is. But you have to go find it. But why wait to reach bottom when you can just take off right now? When you can just, take, when you can just be like, hey, guys, do we need help with something at church? Let's do this. Hermanos, a mí no me tienen que rogar para pasar aquí al frente. I love it. <laughs> I love it. ¿Saben por qué? Porque es una oportunidad más que tengo para decirle a la gente que Cristo Jesús vive, que Cristo Jesús murió en la cruz por ti y por mí, que Cristo Jesús viene por segunda vez. And, and, and you know what? That's exciting. And if you don't believe it, believe it. If you don't believe my story, that's okay. But it's all true. You don't have to wait till you lose everything. You don't have to wait till you're like at the hospital because something might have happened to you. You can just decide right now. You can just tell Jesus, Jesus, take over. Take over my life. And yes, things are different now. I gave my life to the Lord, and here I am. And yes, I am. I am a fashion photographer Monday through Fridays, sometimes Sundays. But Sabbath day, I'm at church. Sometimes Friday nights, I'm at church. And you know what? That excites me even more than taking a picture of some actor or actress, which is cool, um, but that's not exciting. But to know that one day I get to be with my Lord and Savior, that one day I'll be next to, I'll, I'll be seeing him, and I'll be able to talk to him, and I'll be able to tell him, hey, like, thank you for saving me when I needed you. He can save you tonight if you want to. God bless you guys. I say it's deep, right? That was deep, guys. I don't know if, if you were really paying attention, it touched something, right? I mean, your stomach, your heart, something. 
something, right? Uh, everything, okay, every, oh, wow, okay. She, she felt that, all right, awesome. So uh, I want to invite over our guest speaker for today. His name's Seth. He's from Relove Church. Um, funny story, we, I just, you know, something told me we need to reach out to, you know, someone. And I saw his Instagram videos, I saw his church, and, and he preaches with just that power. And you know what, it was just kind of like, I sent him an email and he replied back and I was like, thank you, baby Jesus. And, and here he is today and, and he has the word, so give your time. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Oh, good evening, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Um, how, much, how much time do I have? I just, now he's just telling me to go. How much time do I have out here? Do I have, do I, all, all the time? Can I get five minutes? Can I get five? If, you, if I can get five minutes, let me see your hands. Let me see if I can get five. Five. Okay, that's five, 10, 15, 20, 25. I think so. I'm, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Father, we just thank you so much for the beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us. We thank you so much for a chance to come, even in this evening service, and just to worship you, to sing praises unto your name, to hear how you have moved through our brother's life and how you are continuing to move through his life, truly inspiring. And as we just take a brief moment to open your word, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts, draw us close to you. You know who's here. You know where they're coming from. You know where they are in their life. You know where they are in their spiritual walk with you. You know what they need to hear tonight that will continue to motivate them and push them on towards righteousness. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would just step in and just take over this moment and that your words would be declared, not my own. Lord, we are your people. We're the sheep of your pasture, and we desire to hear a word from you. So just speak to us, God. Your children are listening. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. Amen. So this evening, I just want to um, share a, a quick word with you. I'm trying to keep it in alignment with the, the theme of network and kind of being together. And this word is really um, directed towards our, the young people. So if you consider yourself young, it's for you, right? If you are young, it's also for you. Um, and I just want to thank Jackson for inviting me. Like he said, I pastor the Relove Church in Garden Grove, not too far from here. And um, I'm just glad to be here, preach this morning. I'm glad to be here with you all this, this evening, this afternoon. You know, when I was growing up, I heard a lot of people tell me over and over again that Seth, like, there's a, a key to success. And if you follow this key and if you follow this principle, it's pretty much a guarantee that you will be successful. But like any young person, I didn't always listen to what they had to say. And so I kind of ignored their thoughts, I ignored their counsel, I ignored their wisdom, and I just kind of lived my life the way I felt I wanted to live my life until I reached a point where I was probably in, like, about to graduate from college, about to go into the ministry full-time, that I began to really realize how true this saying is that they've been telling me all my life. And I kind of want to talk with you about it this evening just for a few moments. If you want to be successful, they would say that, you know what, Seth, if you want to be successful, you really have to be extremely intentional and deliberate about who you do life with. You have to be intentional about who you do life with. And I would hear that, and I would say, okay, yeah, I, I get it, but no, I'm just going to live my life. But there's so much truth to that. There's so much truth to the fact that the friends that you choose to associate with, and the people that you choose to hang around, by and large, impact and direct where you are going to be and how successful, however you determine success, your life will be. And so um, it's funny because when you're growing up, there's not much that you can choose. Like you can't choose what family you're born into. Like I can't, I couldn't choose the fact that I was raised in an African American family. And while I'm sitting here listening to the worship and how beautiful it is, I'm trying to interpret my brother's testimony. Right? I'm wishing I was born into a Hispanic family, so I would have gotten some of that. Like I had no choice in the matter. I couldn't choose what family I was born into. I couldn't choose um, whether my parents were married or divorced. I couldn't choose what neighborhood I grew up in or what elementary school I went to or what church I was raised in or what church I was not raised in. Like, I had no choice in the matter. And for much of our lives, there are a lot of things that happen to us or that we experience that we really have no choice over. But there are a few things that we can choose. Like, you can choose what you want to uh, study when you go to school. When you go to college, what your degree is going to be, you can choose what type of car you want to buy. Of course, 
maybe your budget will choose it for you, right? Maybe not so much you, but your budget will choose it. But still, you can choose what type of neighborhood you want to live in when you get older. Um, you can choose whether you're going to buy or you're going to rent. And you can choose who your spouse is going to be, who you're going to marry or, or who she will be or who he will be. You can have a choice in the matter of how many kids you're going to have. And all of those are important choices indeed. But I don't believe that even with all of those choices, they are as important as you making the conscious decision to choose who your friends will be. Like your core, the people that you run with. See, you can choose who you sit at lunch with. And you can choose whose house you go over. And you can choose, if you're like in junior high, whose house you have a slumber party over. And if you're not in junior high and you're still sleeping over people's houses, come talk to me afterwards. Like, you know, but you can choose. You can choose who you hang with. You can choose where you go with them. You can choose whether you want to go to the movies or to the theater or to the mall. Like, you have a lot of choices when it comes to your friends. And I really just want to impress upon you that right now, if you're in that junior high, high school, college age, normally if you're an adult, you've kind of already got this lesson, but maybe even still this will apply to you. But if you're in that demographic, I really want to like almost employ you and beg of you to be very intentional and deliberate about who your friends are. Because your friends will determine your success. They'll determine your spiritual success. Do determine your marriage success. Like, granted, like, if you have some friends and all of your friends are divorced and you're married, I'm not saying you're going to get a divorce, but it's not looking good for you. <laughs> or if all of your friends are, like, uh, are successful and wealthy and you're the only one who's not wealthy and it's not successful, like, at some point they're probably going to stop hanging around you. Because this old saying, and you may have heard it, Birds of a feather flock together. If, you're ch if your friends are in the church and your friends are serving God and they're fired up and they're passionate about it, there's a, a, a strong indication that you too will also be inclined to do spiritual things. And you might not be spiritual, but just because you're hanging around them and they're, doing the, they're following Jesus, you're like, we know if they're following Jesus, well, I can follow Jesus too. Well, if they're doing that, then I can do that too. Have you ever had that one friend where, like, they always had a specific saying that they would always say, maybe a phrase, and then after a while, they said it so many times, like, you started saying it? Has that ever happened to you? Like, when I was in college, I had a friend who always used to say the same thing over and over again, and before I knew it, I started saying it, and I was like, man, I don't want to say it, but because we hung around each other, I said it all the time. It's almost like your friends are almost like, like catching a cold. Like, in fact, just turn to the person next to you and just sneeze on them. Would you do that for me? Just, no, just, <laughs> hachu, just, just hachu. Right, hachu. Yeah, like, like your friends, when they walk up to you and when you walk around them, they are literally sneezing on you. They're sneezing their spirituality on you. They're sneezing their focus on you. They're sneezing their work ethic on you. They're, see, they're sneezing their, their relationship values and priorities on you. And so if you're hanging around friends who are sneezing laziness on you all the time, then it's going to be very hard for you to be diligent. If you're hanging around friends who are sneezing like, like um, um, passive aggressive or procrastinators, like if your friends are always the ones who never get their work done on time and they're always lazy, it's pretty likely that you're not going to be getting your work done on time either. Achoo! Because when you walk up to them, they sneeze on you. And you can't help but catch what they're giving you. And so we see this in the Bible. There's a text. There's a text in the Bible in, um, in Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, it says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and and get in trouble. Walk with the wise and become wise. But if you associate with fools, you'll get in trouble. And here's like, this is Solomon. This is the wisest man who ever lived. And he's basically telling us like, guys, I want to let you know that, that, that whoever you hang around, they're going to have a tremendous impact on your life. Guaranteed, if you hang out with your friends and one of your friends has a car and your friend doesn't keep his car clean, do you know anybody like that? Don't raise your hand. 
if your friend doesn't keep their car clean, their car is always a mess, I guarantee you that their life is also a mess. Because if you don't have the ability to clean up your car, then I guarantee you that you're probably also that type of person that when you get done eating a meal, you don't clean the dishes up right away. You let them sit there for a while. And you're probably also that person where when a bill comes in the mail, you don't pay it right away. You let it sit there for a little while. And when responsibilities come up, you don't take care of them right away. You let it sit there for a little while. And so you can just look at your friend's car and that can be a, somewhat of an indicator of what type of person is sneezing on you and what exactly they're sneezing on you. Because your friends will determine your success, your spiritual success, your marital success. If you have friends that you're hanging around and they're married, maybe it's a young couples that you're hanging around and they're always in counseling, they're always going to marriage retreats, they're always talking about going on vacations with one another and learning each other and studying each other, I guarantee you, most likely, your marriage will be successful as well. Because they're sneezing on you good values. Another verse in Proverbs, another verse in Proverbs, it says, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. He's like, don't associate with, 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 with angry people. Like, if your friends are sneezing anger on you, he's like, don't associate with them. Because you're going to learn their ways. If your friend has a temper, don't associate with them. Because you're going to learn their ways. And so what I want you to do right now is I want you just to take a mental inventory. Don't look around because you may be sitting next to one of your friends. Just take a mental in inventory. What type of friends do I have? In fact, they say that, and you may have heard this before, that you are the sum total of your five closest friends. Have you heard that? You are the sum total. So I take your five closest friends, I can have a summary of who you are. So think about your friendships. Take an inventory and say, are my friends, I mean, yeah, we may have a good time together, but... Are they modeling the values that I feel like I want to model? Are they going in the direction I feel like they want to go? Now, I'm sure all of your friends here that are here are like good friends because they're here. Amen, somebody. Right? So we're not talking about these people, but the people who aren't here, those are the friends we want you to think about. Like, really, are they helping me or hindering me? What exactly are they sneezing on me? Well, there's a story in the Bible that I want to share with you real quick, and then I'll get out your way. In Mark chapter 2, and I don't know if you have your Bibles, but you can turn there, and I'm going to read from the, um, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, if that's okay. Um, I just found that it's generally a little bit easier to understand. Mark chapter 2, and here's a situation where Jesus is in a house, and he's teaching, he's talking, the house is crowded, the house is packed, and the Bible says... In verse 1 of Mark chapter 2, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralytic man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered him, they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, the Bible says, Jesus said to them, to the paralytic man, my child, your sins are forgiven. You read the rest of the story, and we know that Jesus goes on to say, take up your bed and walk, stand up, pick up your mat and walk, and go home. And the man jumped, verse, verse uh, 12, the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked through the door, stunned out onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God. Now, this is an amazing story because here, and I'm sure you've heard it before, here we have this paralytic man who cannot walk. And we don't know how he got into this situation. We don't know if it was his fault or his parents' fault. Maybe he was born like this. Maybe he got kicked in the back of a neck by a horse that he didn't see coming and he was paralyzed. We don't know what happened, but whatever the situation, this man is now on his mat and he's been there for some time. And there's no way that he can fix his condition. The medical technology is not as advanced back then. There's no doctors that can help him. He is resigned to his condition. But for some crazy reason, somehow this man had four friends 
who had the mindset to say, you know what, we're not going to leave our friend in this condition, but we're going to take him to Jesus. Say amen, somebody. And so they pick him up. They come to the house. And I'm fast forwarding the sermon. I'm fast forwarding the story. They come to the house. There's no room to get in, so they climb to the top, and they tear a hole in the roof, and they lower him down. Now, this really speaks to the resolve of the friends. Like, like, will your friend, will your friends be willing to tear a hole in, like, the church roof to get you to Jesus? Amen, somebody. Like, would your friends be willing to go out of their way to make sure that, that, that whatever it is that you need, that you can experience? Well, like, this is exactly what happened. So, so the four friends, they pick him up, they lower him before Jesus. Jesus, and then the, the, it's crazy because the text says, when Jesus saw their faith. The Bible doesn't say when Jesus saw the faith of the paralytic. It says when, when they saw the faith of the friends, the men, Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. I don't know, like, I want friends around me who will be willing that when I'm going wrong and I'm going astray, they won't encourage me, but they will hold me accountable. I want to surround myself for friends where, yeah, we can have a good time, but they, there's a line that we just won't cross. And then if one of us crosses that line, we're going to step up and say, no, nah, bro, that's not how we do things here. I want a friend in my life where if I find myself dating the wrong, the wrong girlfriend, they're going to be like, bro, she's not for you. She's not the one. You're wasting your time. And I want friends that if they see that, listen, I'm tired of my wife and I'm about to throw in the towel on my marriage, that when I call them complaining, they're not going to be like, yeah, man, I agree, man. Yeah, you know, you just, just let it go, man. It's not even worth it. No, I don't want that type of friend. I want the friend who's going to be like, yo, bro, you're tripping, man. Like, just go see a counselor. Take a, go, you know, go on a little, um, let's go on a men's retreat for a weekend. Why don't you come visit? Come down to San Diego. We'll hang out. We'll go fishing. We'll get your mind right. And then you'll go back and be that man that you call, that, that God has called you to be. Like, I want friends in my life where I begin to, when I begin to waver on my Christian faith, that they don't encourage me to explore other religions and other faiths, but they say, hey, man, listen, you, you've seen God in your life, and they remind me of the mighty acts of God. I want to surround myself with friends who, when they see me throwing in the towel on my potential, and they say, Seth, listen, there's more in you than what you're currently experiencing. I want friends that will pick me up and call me to do the right thing. You know, one of my favorite cartoons growing up, I don't know if you, I'm sure you all have seen it, is Lion King. Anyone seen Lion King before? I don't know. Okay, a few of you. So one of my favorite cartoons <laughs> growing up was Lion King. I, I mean, I probably watched Lion King like a hundred times. I don't know why my parents let me do that, but I watched Lion King probably a hundred times when I was a kid. And um, there's a scene in Lion King, right? Where, and you all know the story, you all remember the story? Like there's Simba, and Simba was like the, lo the, the, the little lion cub, and Simba was, um, his, his father was um, Mufasa, and Mufasa had a brother named Scar, and Scar was like that evil brother, and he plotted against his, um, his brother because he wanted, the, he wanted to be the king of the jungle, and so he set Mufasa up, killed Mufasa, and then he, he blamed it on Simba. Simba ran for his life, and so Simba finds himself in like a distant, far jungle, far away from the lion pride. And Simba is a cub. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's all by himself, and so he comes and he meets some friends. You know, remember them? Timon and Pumbaa. I think Timon was like, one was a warthog and one was a meerkat. You all remember that? A warthog and a meerkat. He meets Timon and Pumbaa. And Simba, Timon, and Pumbaa essentially grow up together. And what's crazy is that Timon and Pumbaa, they start teaching Simba how to eat beetles and how to eat worms, and how to eat all types of vermin and vermin. I mean, Simba is a lion. He's supposed to be eating, like, zebra and gazelle and, like, hyena. Like, he's supposed to be eating that real, real good meat. But he's over here eating, like, you know, these soy products. I don't know. No, no. No, he's just, <laughs> I mean, 
I mean, he's over there eating just the, the bugs and the, and, the, and the grass and stuff that lions have no business eating. Simba is not living up to his potential, and yet check this. He's surrounded by friends who are encouraging him not to live up to his potential. He's surrounded by friends who are more concerned with them having a good time than him fulfilling his calling. Simba was called to be king of the jungle. But his friends were like, oh, don't worry about them. Oh, let's just stay out here and swing some, some, from some vines and swim in the river and eat some, um, some, some worms. Uh, Simba, let's just have a good time. And for many years, Simba grew up in that environment. Until one day, Simba encounters someone from his past. It was a sister. His best friend. It was a female, though. A sister. Yeah. He was a brother. She was a sister. <laughs> yeah. He encounters, what's her name? Nala? Nala. And Nala, I mean, she, she's just out looking for some zebra. Like she said, listen, there's no food in the, in, in the, in the homeland. I'm out, I'm out hunting. And she comes across Simba. And she's like, Simba, like, if you've never seen Lion King, this is like total spoiler alert. So I'm giving it all to you all. So Nala is like, Simba, like, where have you been? What are you doing? And Nala has to convince Simba, that there's more to him than what he's currently experiencing. Even though they hadn't seen each other in years, Nala was that good friend who said, no, you're not supposed to be out here eating worms. You are the king of the jungle. And there is purpose and there is power inside of you. And you're supposed to use your life and your influence to make a difference in the jungle. Simba didn't want to hear it. So what did Simba do? He ran, and Simba ran, and he ran, and he encountered a character. He had a dream, like my brother had a dream. He had a dream. I think that's what you said. You had a dream. Okay. I was trying to. I was trying to catch it. He had a dream, and in Simba's dream, he had a dream, and he saw his father, and his father came back to him, and his father said, "Simba, what are you doing?" And this is the line that gets me every time. His father looked at Simba and said, "Simba." You are more than what you have become. You are more than what you have become. You become some joker who just likes to have fun, but you are more than that. You become some person who just likes to, to joke, uh, goof off and have a good time, but you're more than that. You become someone who just likes to joke on people and, and drive around town and, and not be serious about your responsibilities, the class clown, but you're more than that. You've just become someone who doesn't take your, your things seriously and who, who, who's not serious about get, getting involved in church, who's not serious about being there for your family, but you're more than that. You are more than what you have become. And, and I don't know, when I, when I, every time I look at that story and I think about my life and I read the scriptures, I almost hear God saying, listen, make sure you surround yourself with people who recognize who you are and who won't let you settle for less than what you have than what God has called you to experience. Surround yourself because your friends, your friends will determine your outcome. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the individual by the name of Barry Black. Do you know that name at all? Barry Black, Admiral Barry Black. He is um, currently, he serves as the um, chaplain to the United States Senate. He was the highest ranking Navy chaplain um, in the United States. And then he recently, several years ago, he took an appointment as the United States uh, a Senate chaplain. So he sits in chambers with senators and with congressmen and presidents. He, he, he opens up pr prayer breakfasts in Congress with prayer. And he has opportunity to rub shoulders with the, the power players of this country who are making policies that affect us. And he's almost like a a Daniel in Babylon who's in the king's court and has the ability to influence the king with his words. Well, Barry Black, who is a Seventh-day Adventist, by the way, he tells the story of one day when he was a child growing up. I'm going to tell the story, then we'll be done. He tells the story one day he was a child growing up, and one day his friends came knocking on the door, and his friends, and he was probably like, 12, 13, 14 years old. His friends came to his house. He didn't, grow up, he didn't grow up in the best neighborhood. His friends came to his house, and they said, hey, Barry, man, we need you to come help us. 
Some of the boys from down the street just, just jumped one of our friends. We need to go get him back. And Barry's standing at the door. He has three friends in front of him. And his friends are telling him, hey, come with us and let's beat these guys up. Now, what's interesting is that as Barry tells a story, he says that morning he had devotion. And that morning he read in Proverbs where the Bible says that if men entice you to do evil, do not go with them. If people entice you to do evil, do not go with them. And so he's sitting, standing at the door. His friends come up to him and say, come with us and let's go beat up these guys who beat up one of our friends. And Barry looks at them. He remembers what he just read. These are his friends ahead of him. And he makes the, the crucial decision. He says, no, I can't go today, fellas. I'm sorry. They say, oh, man, whatever. And they leave and they go and they get into a fight. And they jump the other, the other boys that were, that beat up one of their friends. It may have been later that day or a few days later where Barry ran into one of them and it just so happened he told them that when they went and they jumped their friend, the other, the other guy, that the guy that they jumped actually was killed and died. And the police got involved, obviously, and now all of them have been arrested. And he's telling this story and he says, you know, looking back over my life and looking back specifically at that situation, if I would have followed my friends and gone with them and gotten this fight, I would not be standing here today as the chaplain to the United States Senate. Because it's very hard to get into this position with a murder on your record. He made the crucial decision to not follow his friends in that critical moment and it was a life-changing moment. So as you consider the choices that you make as a young person, as a youth, a young adult, adult in college, I want you to never take for granted how powerful and influential your friends are over your life. And make sure that you choose your friends wisely. When I gave my heart to Christ, I was 18 years, 17, 18 years old. I had a group of fellas who I used to run with. I, I was the only one with, with the car. So anytime we wanted to go someplace, they would call me. I was the one taking them to the club. I was the one dropping them off at their girlfriend's house. I was the one who was running them all over, the, all over town because I, had to, I didn't even have a car. My mom let me use her minivan. That's how, that's how. It was a Ford Aerostar, right? Seats laid down flat. Got in a lot of trouble with that thing. Let me just tell you. That was before Christ. That was B.C., before Christ. When I gave my heart to the Lord, I made a tough decision. I said, I, I approached my fellow, my, my, my boys, and I said, listen, I'm sorry. I ain't going to the club no more. I'm not doing these things no more. And it wasn't like I had, I lost love for them. Even to this day, I still love them. They're still my friends. But I just recognize that where I'm trying to go and where they were trying to go are two different places. And two people can't walk together unless they're agreed. And so it was a tough decision to cut off some of my friends. And, I, and they often would be like, man, Seth, you think you're too good for us now. You think you're, you're better than us now. Oh, here comes Mr. Holy. Here comes Mr. Spiritual. And they used to tease me all the time about it. And I just had to take it and I had to suck it up. I was like, no, I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think I'm, I, I, it's not that I don't want to hang. I'm just no longer interested in going to the places you want to go. What I had to do was find a different set of friends. And so it was tough. It was hard. But it was the best decision of my life. Because I would not be standing here today before you if I would have kept hanging out with my friends. And it wasn't my friend's fault. It's not like they're bad people. It was my choice who I hung around. I had to choose. And so I want to, I want to challenge you to do an inventory of your friends. And not just your friends, but the type of friend that you are to them and make a decision. Let me make sure I choose wisely who my friends are. 
because at the end of the day, somebody is sneezing on you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, which gives us practical advice and practical counsel on how we should be very selective about our network, how we should be very selective about the people we associate with, and that if we come together as friends and as community and we're and we're very intentional about that choice that it can make it can make such a great impact in our life and in this community but at the same time if we choose to hang around people that are not going in the right direction god and that will have detrimental impact on us and so lord i just pray for every youth for every young person for every teenager preteen. i pray for every young adult in this house lord i pray for every adult that as we continue to live our life, that we would be very selective and intentional and careful about who we surround ourselves with. And that we would be that friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and that we would make sure that we surround ourselves with friends, male and female, who are going to lead us in paths of righteousness, hold us accountable, and keep pressing us on in the right direction. So we thank you, Father. I thank you for this gathering and for this fellowship. Bless us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Seth, for that beautiful um, sermon, sema that you had that you shared with us. And also, thank you, Gil, for at, um, for sharing your testimony with us. That's very personal, and hopefully it touched at least one person's heart here. And I'm totally adding you to my top five group of friends. Um, and I was, oh, I'm here, I'm up here because I want to ask if whoever's in charge of the ofrendas, if they can come up. Before we go around, we're going to bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for bringing us here tonight. As we are closing your Sabbath, thank you for giving us the freedom to come and learn more about you and worship your name. Uh, I ask in specific for the offering that will be picked up right now at this moment. May you bless everybody who gives and those who are not able to. Um, either way, God, just be in our lives, be in our hearts, and um, help us just be kind to one another and be the light that this world needs to see. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, and now is the time for our, um, some announcements, so if you have um, any announcements, you just come up here. Um, I know for Feja, tomorrow is the soccer tournament. Um, it w it'll be at Anaheim Spanish at nine in the morning. We will also be having food sale, so please come and support Feja. Um, Camp Uno, if you haven't registered, please do so. Any other announcements? Just for Broadway um, Church, just remember our regular services tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., prayer, y luego el miércoles, el servicio de, um, de culto. Um, and then also, um, este, el próximo sábado, comienza la semana de oración juvenil en nuestra iglesia. Así que, um, hermanos este, de Broadway tomen no, nota de eso la próxima semana, esta semana no tomen break después de VBX que si estuvieron aquí espero que hayan disfrutado um, y ya la próxima semana comenzando el sábado a sábado este, um, una semana de oración juvenil um, tonight um, there will be volleyball and then kids, all kids are welcome to and then those young at heart or kids at heart we're going to be having a movie night, okay? So movie night at the uh, at Lighthouse upstairs. Volleyball in the gym, soccer, lo que, um, lo que dispongan. Venta de comida. Don't go to Taco Bell, all right? You can have Taco Bell here, all right? Even better. Forget I said that. Um, y no, este, um, y creo que eso de Broadway, um, eso es todo. Dios les bendiga. Hey, guys, on behalf of Uno Camp, and I need your attention because a lot of you guys are already signed up, and some of you actually were ready to sign up. As perhaps you know that our beloved camp, Pine Springs Ranch, is at risk due to the Cranston fire. So for now, 
the season is suspended, which means that on Tuesday, we will let your leaders and your pastors know if UNO camp is going to happen, okay? Um, it's completely shut down right now. There's no access that I know of as of yesterday. So please keep those that live in Pine Springs Ranch in your prayers and our camp in your prayers. And anyone who has been affected by the different fires here in California and in just different places. Okay, if you have any questions, please talk to myself or my husband back there. Um, he can go ahead and make sure that anything that you guys want to know regarding this, um, he'll help you. So right, as of now, it's tentative, and we hope that um, everything will be okay in our camp, and we are trying to see if there could be a plan B, not an actual camp for the weekend because it's too short notice. Emergencies and life happen sometimes, so as of now, we will get in touch with your pastors and your youth leaders, okay? Thanks. All right, guys. I feel like we've been so blessed today. I feel like, you know, we've learned a lot of things, but I think two things is, like, shoot your shot, you know? Just, just like, if you feel like you, you need something in your life, just go for it. And then the other thing is make sure you squad up with the right people. You know, you can't, you got to check your squad, make sure you got the right five, because you don't want to end up in divorce court or something. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, with that being said, we'd like to invite Mr. Seth over here to give us our final prayer. And then when he's done, we're, we're dismissed. Uh, let's all stand together, can't we? Again, Father, we just thank you for this fellowship over this week. We thank you for this gathering this evening. And as we go forth from this place, may we, have, may we go forth better than how we came stronger with clearer minds clearer convictions stronger convictions and a better understanding of who you are and your purpose for our lives so we just thank you bless us as we leave this place but never from your presence in jesus name let everybody shout amen amen amen, amen. all right have a good week guys have a good week <laughs>